the role of technology in the early childhood classroom. And when I'm talking about the early childhood classroom, I'm talking about birth through grade three. And the second piece, which is um, related, will be the changes to the NAYC developmentally appropriate practice position statement, specifically part two, which are the principles of child development. And so that's gonna be, we're gonna do a time, some time on the first half and do some breakout rooms and brainstorming. And then we'll go to the DAP position statement uh, toward the end of our time together. So when we are thinking about what IPA USA is here to do for you. Um, we have many things and I hope you'll investigate our website to see all, all that we offer. But our primary role is to help the USA who signed the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child during the Clinton administration, but the Senate has failed to ratify the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. And so of 196 countries who have signed it and ratified it, um, the USA is the only one that has failed to put it into practice. And so that is a huge issue that we continuously work on. We also um, create policy briefs on a variety of topics. Um, most of them are for our members, but the one on the importance of play is available under our advocacy tab on the website. We also have ways to organize a play day in your community. Uh, we have a play quiz for parents on does your child get enough time to play? All of those are available um, to everyone. Uh, we also have several resources, one of which are the porch play chats. And porch play chats are conversations with individuals who are just as passionate about play as we are. And they're between 20 and 35 minutes long. And they're available through our YouTube channel, which you can access from our website. And if you go to our Facebook page and become a friend, you'll automatically see them every Monday. There's one in your, in your on our Facebook page every Monday. Uh, later, I'll be asking if anybody would like to do a porch play chat. We're getting ready to tape the next series in July and we welcome uh, anyone to do that. On the website, we also have a play talk blog where as new information comes available on the importance of play, uh, it goes into our play talk blog. We also have information on the alarming trends that are affecting childhood and a new resource that became available in um, uh, August of last year. Mm, I think that's wrong in February of this year are the play choice boards. Um, and some things to do with children to promote play during a pandemic, which we've all been living through. We also recruit and support state play advocates. And so if you're interested in becoming a state play advocate and doing at least one play event for your community or program, you're welcome to join us. Uh, we have um, meetings on a regular basis, Zoom meetings on a regular basis to support you to do that. Uh, for members, we have many grants. So if you're an individual who walked into a primary grade classroom or an early childhood classroom and you have no materials that would promote a child's ability to play and to manipulate loose parts or whatever, you can apply as a member for a mini grant um, that will support you in purchasing some materials. And then finally for our um, for our members, we have a quarterly play blast, which really is sort of a compilation. This last one was nine pages long, a compilation of all the happenings um, that are taking place and upcoming conferences from all of our play partners, as well as our journal. And our journal is a, is a wonderful resource um, with articles all about play. So that kind of gives you a little bit of an overview for what we do. And of course, we always, because we're a nonprofit, we always do fundraisers. So we have a t-shirt fundraiser, Trees Over Screens, um, which we're very proud of and which we enjoy using. And so upcoming events before we get started, uh, I mentioned the Play Choice Boards and the Creating the Outdoor Classroom. That will be our August Town Hall. So for those of you in programs or who have um, on-site child 
care facilities, this might be a really great town hall for you. Um, Lisa Latimer, who is our state play advocate chair and um, her outdoor classroom teacher, Aiden, are both going to be the experts on, on that town hall. And then coming up in October, we'll have a live speaker series uh, on the child's right to play. And we're very excited. We have two international speakers as well as many wonderful um, US speakers who will be focused on the child's right to play and providing uh, sessions for that. If you participate live during those days, there'll be one or two a day um, for each of those days. If you participate live, you'll be able to have a question and answer session with the presenters. And if you can't participate live, those sessions would be recorded for you. So um, we'll talk more about that later. Okie doke, I'm gonna keep making the slides go. So here's the issue. It seems wherever I go, and you know, I haven't been in public much because of the COVID pandemic, but I'm still driving my car and I'm seeing children on iPads or iPhones or screens of some sort when they're traveling in the car with their families. When we could go into restaurants, I saw everybody at the table with a screen of some type that was, um, was troubling to me because no conversation was happening. Everybody was zoned in. They might be eating at the same table, but they were zoned in on their screens. And so I, I've also seen as a faculty member, I've also seen my students, I have a lot of traditional students as well as students who are non-traditional, but my traditional students have grown up with screens. And so their belief is that you don't sing songs with children, you put on a YouTube video. You don't read a book to children, you put on the book that's being read on the YouTube channel. You um, don't take children outside in a cloud study to look at clouds, you pull it up on the smart board. And, and so there's this disconnect <laughs> between how adults use screens and the role of technology, how children with special needs use screens and technology, and what is appropriate for early care and education birth to five, so, and for our primary grade kids. So it's a, it's a dilemma that has been bothering me for a long time, and with the changes to the principles of child development, I thought it was time to have a conversation. So this is what our goals are for today. And then after the session, I just want you to know you'll receive a PDF of this presentation, every breakout rooms Google Doc, and an MIT article on no computer left behind, which I've used as one of the sources. I've used many sources which are on the reference page. So again, we start here, right? Early childhood, maybe two and a half or three-year-old children who are absolutely fascinated, and we know that children learn through imitation, absolutely fascinated with what they see their family shoes. But is that what we need? Is that what children, is this how children learn? And so it becomes something that we really need to focus on and think about. And we, we also have to recognize that technology is here to stay. It can be beneficial, but one of the things that I think we're missing is that technology is a tool, one tool in a teacher's toolbox. It shouldn't be replaced. It shouldn't replace active learning. And when we only use technology to teach, and we're gonna talk more about this in a minute. When we only use technology, technology to teach, it's not helpful if that's the only way that children are learning. And so if it's used in place of active learning, it then becomes harmful. And I'm not sure, I'm not sure that's recognized, um, both with families and with the education community because it's been so promoted 
they, I mean, there. I walk into primary grade classrooms to do field observations, and it's just horrifying to me that there are no materials, there are no books, there are Chromebooks, and there's a smart board. And so when I talk about screen time, this is what I'm thinking about iPhones, iPads, tablets, computers, fun games, which I use in my college classroom, Kahoots and Jamboards, but we do many other things. It's one tool in the toolbox, smart boards or something that's equivalent, YouTube, TV, DVD, video games, and social media. And so when we think about all of those different screens that children are exposed to, then we kind of need to know what the world is recommending. And in the US, for infants and toddlers, no screen time, no screen time for children under 18 months, unless it's seeing Nana during the pandemic or a grandparent or a parent who might be out of town. For early childhood, so this is children that are, you know, two to five, one hour of quality programming that is co-viewed with their parent is what is the recommendation in the US. But we know that children are exposed to screens much more than that when they go home. And so why then do we need to use screens in our early care and education programs. And of course, when they get to school age and adolescence, the social, social interaction is really important. But again, we have to say, okay, what's the limit? What is that technology doing? What's it replacing? And that's what we need to be thinking about. In Canada, there is no, no recommendation. No, children, infants, and toddlers should have no screen time in early childhood less than one year, in adolescence less than two years, two hours, sorry, one hour and two hours. And then in Australia, none under 12 months of age. In New Zealand, none. In Germany, none under 12 months of age. And then you can see the other requirements. And so we are overusing or overexposing children to screens, particularly in what I see in the US. And it is against the recommendations that are out there. So when we think about that, and Joanna, thank you. We don't use technology in our program very frequently, but on the rare occasion, we'll show a video. Um, uh, just to see kids go from being active and engaged little people to immobile lumps on the carpet. <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> you know we know that technology is passive learning in, in most cases. And so what promotes a child's development? I don't think it's this. And so as we think about what promotes child development, we need to get back to our roots. We need to get back to thinking what is it that the theorists taught us about child, a child's development? And they saw children develop and they didn't have screens. And so what was it in their research that demonstrated how children learn? And that's where we need to get back to. So we're gonna to go to our first breakout group. And so uh, Michelle, thank you, Michelle. Michelle is going to put the link to the Google document in the chat box. Before I break you into groups, what you're going to do is you're going to go directly to the slide that is assigned to your group. So if you're in room one, go to slide one. If you're in room three, go to slide three. And then with your group, pick a scribe, someone who will take notes onto the Google Slides. And then go ahead and fill out your, your Google slide. If you need more room, I only gave one slide per room. You can make your font smaller so you can fit more on there. And I'll figure out how to make it readable before we send it to you. You're going to have about six minutes 
probably in that breakout room and you'll have a timer that counts down. If you wanna come back sooner, that's absolutely fine. So the first thing you're gonna do is copy that link so that when you get to your breakout room, you can go to your browser and put in that link and get your Google Doc. And then you're gonna pick a scribe and then you're gonna fill out your Google form. And I just wanna make sure I've got everything that I'm supposed to tell you. Yes, okay. So we're did, headed to breakout rooms. Yes, did, did you see that um, it's, right now it's set as a view only. So someone will need to go in and um, make sure that we can all edit it because right okay. now we can only see it. All right, Her, let me do that quick. Thanks. Let me go over here. Thanks, Rachel. All right, so this one. All right, so I shared that. Um, what do we want to do? You'll want to change where it says viewer, change it to editor. Where is viewer? Let's see. Oh, I see. When I go in here. Mm -hmm. I'm just imagining what you're doing. I have no idea. <laughs> oh, you know, you're not seeing it. No. <laughs> um, viewers and commenters can see the option to download and print. Nope. Editors. Okay. I think I've got it though. I think I'm going to send out an updated link now. Okay, great. All right. Let's see. How about now, Rachel? And I'll go do that on the rest of them before we break into those breakout rooms. All right, so I'm gonna, you think we're good, Michelle? Rachel, are we good? So it looks like Michelle gave you a new one. The second link has the updated permission so everyone should be able to edit. Okie doke. So everybody go in and edit. So we're gonna do five breakout rooms. We got your link. Rachel, is it working? Good to go. Okay. We're gonna do four breakout rooms. Here we go. And open all rooms. There we go. Okay. See you in a few minutes. There we go. So when it takes up too much space, when it replaces actual learning, when it replaces social interaction, because as you'll see in the report from No Computer Left Behind, children are very isolated. Um, and what I find is interesting is that the schools are talking about, we're gonna give your child their own Apple iPad or their own iPad or, or um, uh, other type of device. And we're going to make sure that their, their app that they're working on is aligned with where they are developmentally. And so now we're isolating children and putting them in ability groups. And what you're gonna find in that article from MIT is that it doesn't really work well. <laughs> so, um, it's harmful when it is when is it not harmful is when it's the focus of what's happening inside the program, lack of interaction with humans, when it's used to in place of communication, absolutely for children with special needs, when children are playing with apps where they can manipulate things, uh, when they're missing real real concepts based on their experiences, lack of hands-on experience always that I I attest to that. Um, whenever it takes the place of real life interactions, especially outside in nature, when it's biased, yes. Uh, and that's also in that article that you're going to be getting. Um, when it's harmful from a linguistic perspective because children are not in conversation and the 
and the articulation that they're hearing from the speaker is robot-ish, not inflection-ish, right? So you have this mechanical voice that is talking to you, this virtual reality voice. Um, when it is, um, when we ask them to do that for self-regulation, is that why? Is that what you meant? Because that's a big problem, because uh, it just isolates them more and doesn't teach them anything. Um, uh, when it undermines the value of play, and that is again uh, IPA's uh, biggest concern. When he creates distance, mm -hmm. um, is there really a place? I don't think so. We're going to talk about that. Uh, and we don't know the long-term health implications, but we do know when children weren't outside for recess because they decided to focus on academics instead of allowing children to go outside and have recess, they, we had an obesity issue begin to develop. And that was shortly after No Child Left Behind. Okay, so we're gonna go back to the PowerPoint. Thank you for your participation. That was wonderful. And so, we now recognize that technology can be harmful to children, to some children. And we recognize that when they're in on a screen that they're so focused on that screen that sort of the rest of the world sort of goes away, right? And so there sometimes, and I, I don't know how many of you play any of the computer games. I remember when I was going through my uh, doctorate program, um, my current husband's children were playing uh, World of Warcraft and I'd never played World of Warcraft before. And they were all teens and everything. And so they said, well, we'll teach you. And so sure enough, um, they showed me sort of how to navigate World of Warcraft. And um, can you see the PowerPoint, everyone? Can you go ahead and put it back up? I did put it back up. Are you not seeing it? Oh, I love technology. Let's go back. Not seeing it though. You're not seeing it? Okay, no. I'm going. Share screen. Here we go. Okay, can you see it now? Yay! Okay, so this little munchkin. So when um, I was working on my dissertation, they showed me how to do it. And so I was like, you know, working my way through it, trying to figure it all out, which I'm not really good at. And so finally I said, okay, I'm done for the day. How long have I been on here? And they said an hour and 15 minutes. And I said, oh my God, I can never go in here again because it just, it just you're just so focused <laughs> on, on what's happening. So I, I don't think I ever played World of Warcraft again because I had other things I needed to do. So we also know that too much screen time and this is, I have a whole list of resources for you on the, on the uh, PDF that you'll be getting sleep problems, lower grades in school, they don't read real books, less time with family and friends, not enough outdoor physical activity. Of course, that obesity issue, mood problems, self-image and body issues, especially for teen girls on social media. <laughs> I love the commercial that's on now. I mean, I hate that commercial, but about a teen who's on social media and trying to make herself look prettier. Oh my God, it just scared me. Fear of missing out of what's happening and less time to find more healthy ways to relax. And so, and then of course there are the dangers of screen time, right? So we have lots of dangers, um, violence and risk-taking behaviors because some of those videos have unsafe stunts, sexual content and sexual predators, uh, negative stereotypes if everybody looks perfect, substance use, cyber bullies, advertising that's aimed at children and misleading or inaccurate information. So all of these things are dif difficult. And so I think one of, our, um, one of our responsibilities as educators is to help parents understand why screens are not the best, you know, uh, and I mean, full disclosure, my 18 month old uh, granddaughter who was, is now 11. <laughs> um, of course we all had our smartphones. And so she didn't know what to do with a smartphone but she knew to flip 
across the screen because she'd watched her mom do it and me do it. She would flip that her little finger across the screen. I was like, okay, now we have to take that away. <laughs> it's crazy. And so these are some tips that you can help families with that parents really need to understand what those world recommendations are, especially the U.S. recommendations from the American uh, AAP, American Association of Pediatrics. Okay, so here is where we're going to really be thinking about the role of technology in the birth through grade three classrooms. And so again, Rachel, will you test it out for me? You're gonna copy the Google link that um, is going in the chat. And this should be the correct one, I hope. And then once you're in your breakout room, you're gonna go directly to your rooms slide. And you'll have, this one you have three different things to look at. So I'm gonna give you about 10 minutes. So make sure you pick a scribe, could be the, uh, you'll probably be with different people because I'm letting it automatically send you. So Rachel, is it working? Can you do something? It's working great. Woo! <laughs> okay, so off we go. I'll bring you back in 10 minutes. So let me make sure that somebody is in there. And then we create a sign automatically. All right, here we go. See you in a little bit. Did I? Well, no problem. That and then I tried to put things in the in room room two, but I don't know. I mean, I see things in room two. Yes, you did good. Yeah, we did. I mean, we just desperately tried to put some stuff in after filling up, helping people in room one. Well, that's wonderful. As long as we got the information, Absolutely. there's no judgment yeah. on which room you put it in. Right. <laughs> I might have grabbed the wrong link there for that. I was trying to get all the links updated. Sorry if we were helping everybody else type. <laughs> okay, no problem. Okay, no. So there are appropriate uses of technology in for teachers right and so with a focus on assessment so i do want to tell you a, an article that mike huber and i wrote um that i'm hoping will be in child care information exchange in july uh we've submitted it for the july uh publication and the mike came up with the first line this should have been a banner year <laughs> and it talks about how, tech, not how technology isn't really doing what we what it's been promised to do, and so I encourage you to um, look for that article. I'll let you know if when and if it's been published. And so we do know that with this really zeroed in focus on assessment, that teachers it's easier for teachers to use an iPad or some piece of technology to be able to 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 complete those assessments. Whether or not those assessments are really measuring and if the teacher's time is uh, how useful they are, I, I question because it feels like teachers feel pressured to do that assessment so they're not interacting with children. So I, I'm concerned about that. Um, it, you can use it to teach dis digital citizenship um, when it is teacher-led and monitored but again, I think that's not for the birth to five classrooms. That might be better for the K through three classrooms. Um, and you can, of course, share resources. So I've got a couple more for teachers in a minute that we'll go through. Of course, with children with disabilities who cannot communicate, those augmented technologies are amazing and allow them an opportunity to communicate. And I really, I, I really want us to think about baby sign, right? So baby sign where children can communicate before they have the ability, their mouth is formed so that they can actually speak and create words that they are able to communicate with us with baby sign through baby sign, not through technology. And so when children who have special needs aren't able to communicate, Technology is providing them a way to do that. And then for children birth to four, I, this is where I think we've just gone crazy. 
um, you just cannot walk into a classroom. I, I walked into a fourth grade classroom to do a field observation for a student and they all had Chromebooks and they were in a portable unit because the school was being remodeled. And so the tables were all squished. I mean, I would have lost my mind in that room and I felt so badly for the teacher. But, uh, and the Chromebooks, first they didn't boot up, then the kids couldn't access the application, which was their book for reading the story that they needed to read in order to move forward. So the teacher and my student spent 20 minutes and I'm not kidding, 20 minutes, because I timed it, trying to get everybody on their Chromebooks into the reading page, and then had 10 minutes to then be able to actually do what it was they were going to do. Deb, you're muted. Deb, we lost your audio there for a second. There we go. Hopefully I haven't been muted for that long. Um, but anyway, so when we think about technology in the K through fourth grade classroom, it's, it's really gotten out of control. And I believe it's because people have been so focused on achieving those standardized test scores and the promises that technology made, which it really hasn't kept. You muted yourself again. It again, sorry, here I am. Um, I don't know why it keeps muting me for some crazy reason. So as we are closing up this session and moving back to the PowerPoint, we have uh, one more thing before we move on to the principles of child development. So thank you for keeping me honest. All right, so for teachers, uh, one of the things that I think is really um, important is to consider um, the technology that, that teachers can use to communicate with families. So we know that uh, you know the younger generation is having uh, is very, very much dependent on technology. And so Edmodo is like a Facebook page for a classroom where a teacher can post things on Edmodo to keep parents up to date. And then there are several of these types of parent communication programs, Cambu, Class Dojo, there's many out there. But those are where, where teachers can send photos, of children's work to parents, where they can make announcements to parents, where parents can um, chat with them during a specific part of time or say, oh, I made a doctor's appointment for Sarah and I'm gonna pick her up early. Parents can do all that communication. It's not for children, it's for parents and teachers. And so that is one use of technology that I think is important that teachers could use. Can you see the screen? You switch back to PowerPoint. Uh huh. Can you see the PowerPoint? Not quite yet. Okay, hold on. Every time I share it, it goes away. All right, here we go. Okay, I love technology. Not. And then I want to thank Cindy and Jen, who are special ed folks in Downing in the Downingtown School District, who really helped me gather some of the assistive technology and physical assistive technology that children with special needs are currently using. And having seen pictures of Jen's classroom, Jen has many things that are not technology related and I appreciate that too. So thanks to Jen for sharing her classroom and thanks for Cindy for gathering this information for me. And so there are, and some of these were mentioned in the Google Doc, there are core boards and symbol sticks and Proloquo which are communication devices, uh, communication apps for children who have a, have a diffi difficulty uh, communicating. And then of course, there's all the things that help them get around. And so the electronic scooters and specialized bikes and the strollers that um, keep them safe while they can go out and the swings that they can use in both the classroom and outside. So there are uses for technology to support children with special needs. 
But in an early childhood classroom, hmm, I love light tables. I want a light table for my classroom. I don't have one yet for my demonstration classroom, but I'm going to get one. Um, I think light tables and this, this touch lights piece and a camera where children can take pictures, I think those are all fine. But I, I don't think app iPads or uh, any other screen is appropriate. Uh, and that's my opinion, but I do think that there is some use for technology in an early childhood classroom. It's just not technology that is not active learning. So this is the article I've been talking to you about. Um, and so I've given you, I think the, the most important piece of this is these two slides, which will be a little clearer in your article. These are the slides that I was able to get off of the, um, of the article. But if you look on the slide to the left, the percentage of students who answered every day, these are the students in the US who use technology tools every day. And how often do you use digital learning tools? And look at those percentages. 57% for all students, 45% for elementary, 64% for middle, 63% for high school. That is not using it as a tool. That is using it as a primary mode of learning. When we think, when we ask teachers about the technology that they're using, um, they answered either all or half of the class time. They're using technology, some digital learning tool for their subject matter. And you can see the breakout of all the subject matters there. Then when they ask teachers, um, do you support the following statements? There's a lot of information available about the effectiveness of the digital learning tools I use. Only 27% of the teachers said there was a lot of information. I support the use of digital learning tools. 85% answered that question. I wish my students could use more digital learning tools in class to learn 59% of teachers said that. So when we go to the top of the screen, in, in the article, there's two or three really powerful stories that the authors tell us about. And one of them is when she went into a primary grade classroom and every child was on their own iPad and they were working independently based on their ability level. And she noticed that a child was getting really frustrated. So she went over to the child and she sat down and she said, what are you doing? And he said, I, I just wanna play a game. Can't I just play a game? And she said, well, well what, is, what, is, what is this? And he said, I, I don't understand it. I, I don't know what it wants me to do. And so it came down to a vocabulary issue. He didn't know the definition of a particular vocabulary word that was in the instructions. And so he wasn't doing anything. And, and, you know, there were two or three examples of that. And I was like, oh my God. So these children are isolated. They're in a classroom with the teacher, but the teacher of course is working with other children and they're supposed to be working through based on their ability level. It's not working, it's not working. So we really need to be thinking about that. And there's nothing wrong with using technology as a tool to do research when things aren't available outside, right, or in their community. But it is, it's important that we do hands-on learning, even if they're in middle, second, and secondary classrooms, definitely in primary grade classrooms, but in middle and secondary classrooms, just as important, active, hands-on learning. Um, one of my stepsons uh, is a middle school teacher and he uses board games, board games, real board games, not technology in his classroom to teach history concepts. Of course, project learning is where we should be going with young children instead of, and older children. We should be doing project learning, not siloed instructional, you know, we're gonna do math now, then we're gonna do social studies, then we're gonna do reading, then we're gonna do science and none of it works together. It's isolated and siloed. Vygotsky tells us we should be using mixed ability groups, not, not homogeneous ability groups. 
there need to be different choices in the way students are able to complete assignments. It shouldn't just be one way to do it. They need choices. We should have outdoor learning labs and maker spaces in primary, middle, and secondary classrooms. And instead of putting everybody in rows like we did, you know, in the industrial revolution, we should be creating alternative classroom designs. And Edutopia has lots of resources for many of these ideas that are in your references. And so it can be used as a tool, <laughs> not the primary learning mode. It can be used for research when the topic isn't, they can't go outside or they can't take a field trip. It can be used as documentation for teachers and for students to demonstrate their ability to reach the outcomes or the goals for that day. So now, when we think about the essentials of play, this is from Walter Drew and uh, Marsha Nell's book, um, From Play to Practice. And, it, and to me, even though this is for children birth to five, to me, this it doesn't matter how old you are. Children make their own decisions about what, how to approach an activity, what to play with and who to play with. Children choose how to play for themselves instead of the teacher saying, okay, you're gonna play with Legos, you're gonna play with blocks and you're gonna go to dramatic play. When children are able to make these own decisions, then they are intrinsically motivated to discover and explore. And they become immersed in the moment. And the other piece we really have to understand is in the importance of play, regardless of the age or grade level, play is spontaneous, not scripted. We don't tell children what to play. If they're in a middle school classroom, we give them choices about how would you like to demonstrate that you understand this historical perspective, right? And it's enjoyable, not laborious. And so again, you know, the worksheet dilemma comes to mind, all of these things sort of come to mind, but it, it and I have to tell you, the worksheet dilemma is driving me even crazier than most other things. So we're not going to do this breakout because I want to get to the NAYC principles of child development, but you could put in the chat your ideas for how does the use of screens limit time for play, discovery, and the exploration for birth through third grade children. And you're welcome to put that in the chat and we'll add that to the handouts that we give you. So we're going to sort of do a an abrupt shift now to talk about the concerns to the part two of NAYC's new position statement on developmentally appropriate practice. Um, it's important to know that part one and part three are incredible, absolutely incredible. And people who are supporting what they did with part two say, well, you have to look at the whole DAP statement and not just look at one section. Well, unfortunately, that's not how students view it. And that's not how faculty don't have time to, you know, we are going to talk about the new DAP statement, but we don't have time to go into the, the roots of the DAP statement. We're going to try to get across the importance of developmentally appropriate practice. And so NAYC asked for stakeholder input. And I, of course, provided lots. And many people that I've talked to provided much input that was against reducing the principles from 12 principles to nine and the content of those nine principles that they were proposing. Um, so the IPA Board of Directors, the NAYC Play Policy and Practice Interest Forum, and many other individuals and interest forums and stakeholders are also expressing concern with the part two of principles of child development. And so what we're hoping to do is gather more people who are just as concerned about this as we are and to send a letter to NAYC, which you have a draft of, um, and to begin a conversation about these concerns. And so this is sort of the pieces of DAP, the new position statement. And when you read it, it sounds wonderful. <laughs> 
absolutely wonderful. Um, it, you know, it really talks about the importance. It talks about how all their position statements or recent position statements are sort of coming together around what is important in an early childhood classroom for young children and their families. And so the core considerations, the principles of child development and the guidelines for DAP are all within the DAP statement. Again, part one, the core considerations and part three are fabulous. It is part two that is raising concerns. So what I've done for you here is I've given you the 12 principles of child development that were the original version in 2009. And I have given you the revised ones as of last fall. I also sent you the whole DAP statement. And so what I want us to consider is, is concerns that you may have about the old ones, but particularly the concerns you may have about the new ones. And so if we look at them one by one, uh, we, I agree with number one, development and learning are dynamic. It's a complex interplay between the environment. Um, I'm gonna move my little talking thing and the biological characteristics of the child. But again, here, I also think it is influenced by the relationships that children have, but that's not mentioned in the new side. All domains of a child's development, absolutely, we can all agree on this, as well as the, as the approaches to learning, absolutely, are important to a child's development. Of course, play moved from, I think, 10 in the 12 principles of child development from the 209 edition to third, which is wonderful. Very excited that that's there. And they talk about the importance of social competencies, language and cognitive skills. Um, and so really important. I don't see anything about physical development in there and that's a concern. Um, I just wanna make sure it didn't just mute me again. Okay, good. Uh, general progressions of development and learning can be identified, but of course there are variations based on a child's cultural context, their experiences and their individual differences. Absolutely agree, it's absolutely fine. Children are active learners, absolutely. Um, they are constantly taking in and organizing information to create meaning through relationships. That's the first time relationships has been discussed, their interactions with their environment and their overall experience. Children's motivation to learn is increased when they have a sense of belonging and purpose and agency. So every child should feel welcome. Every child should see representations of themselves in the classroom, absolutely wonderful. Children learn in an integrated fashion, absolutely wonderful. Of course they do, they don't learn in silos and adults don't learn in silos either. Development and learning advance when children are challenged. There's Vygotsky again, very important. But the one that is absolutely missing are the, is the one on the old side, children develop best with secure, consistent relationships with responsive adults and opportunities for positive relationships with peers. Not a lot about a relationship with a teacher is on the new focus. And then the last one that just put me over the top was used responsibly and intentionally. Technology and interactive media can be valuable tools for supporting children's development and learning. As we've discussed from the beginning of this town hall, technology is a tool, it is not a principle of a child's development. And so this is, this is where IPA is concerned. This is where other organizations are concerned. This is where many individuals are concerned. And I'm wondering if you share those concerns. And so in our last few minutes together, we're gonna to do one more breakout room. And so in the chat, you're going to have the last one about concerns and comments on changes to the NAYC principles of child development. So the exact same 
way that you're going to do it. I'm gonna send you into breakout rooms. There'll be different people again. Go to the slide that your breakout room um, is with and you have about seven minutes, eight minutes to do this one. Uh, probably seven because we're getting low on time and I wanna respect your time. So uh, Rachel, would you make sure that works before I send people to their breakout rooms? Looks like it works. So excited. I'm going to put three people in each one this time. Okay. Um, so off you go. There are five, one, two, three, four, five people in the first room. So I'm sorry. Um, but there are four people in the second room and four people in the third room. All right. So here you go. Okay, is everybody's coming back? Thank you for all of that. I'm going to spend the next few minutes wrapping up. You will get copies of all the feedback from all the other groups. So if you would like to add your name and your affiliation to the letter to NAYC, or if you have additional comments to make, you can put those in the chat or you can email me um, at the IPA USA email address, which I'm getting ready to give you. As soon as I can move the screen, I love technology. Um, and just a reminder that uh, the August Town Hall is all about uh, creating and using an outdoor class classroom and the play choice boards. Um, and the virtual speaker series will be uh, the week of October. I'm trying to move this up so you can see it, October 4th through 9th. And uh, there'll be live sessions as well as um, uh, recorded sessions for you. If you, uh, there's many ways that you can participate uh, in IPA USA. We hope you'll join us. But if that isn't on your uh, list of things to do, know that if you do join us, you can join from our website at ipausa.org. But then you're going to be sent to IPA World's Apricot platform. And because IPA World um, is based in London, you'll be paying in British pounds. And so it's about, it's about $50 a year. And of course, we... It, one mini grant would give you uh, six times your return on that if you applied for a mini grant as a member. And so if you would also like, if you have a topic that you would like to talk about on a town hall, we'll be doing these at least twice a year. Um, you can email me at ipausa2019user at gmail.com. If you'd like to um, participate in a porch play chat, and be a guest speaker on the porch play chats. You can certainly do that as well. This is more stuff and there's the references. Uh, porch play chats are um, brief 25 to 35 minute conversations with people who are passionate about play. And we're scheduling our July folks um, for our July tapings. So I wanna thank you so much for participating. This has been wonderful and we appreciate everything, your willingness to spend some of your busy time as a faculty member. I know this is a crazy time. And I hope we'll see you in future town halls or at the October virtual speaker series. So thank you so much for your participation. Bye everyone. <laughs>